Ladies and gentlemen, as president of the Hague Institute for Global Justice, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this distinguished speaker event. Last Thursday, as part of our series, we welcomed our first sitting foreign minister when Slovakia's Miroslav Lajcek addressed an audience at the Institute on the topic of EU enlargement. Today we will continue to debate that important theme. To do so, it is a particular honor for us to welcome for the first time at our Young Institute a sitting Prime Minister, Eddie Rammer of Albania. Mr. Rama's visit to the Institute and to The Hague could not be more timely. The debate last week served as a reminder as to the results of the European elections, that enlargement remains a complex and controversial topic in old, new, and aspiring member states alike. The delay in the agreement on candidate status for Albania, initially recommended by the European Commission in October 2012, is emblematic of this controversy. A number of member states, not least in the Netherlands, expressed serious doubts about whether Albania was ready for this important step. Last December, a motion against granting candidate status was passed by the Dutch Parliament. The overall context of enlargement and the economic financial crisis in Europe has also dampened optimism about the further growth of the Union. Member states, which were once the most fervent supporters of continued expansion of the EU, must increasingly respond to the concerns of their domestic populations. Nevertheless, there is cause for optimism. It now seems likely that Albania will be granted candidate status this June. In its meeting of December 2013, the General Affairs Council of the EU welcomed the further action taken in the fight against corruption and organized crime, commending the commitment of the new government. It noted that Albania still had work to do in judicial reform, <coughs> combating organized crime and economic governance, but deemed itself impressed by the momentum it reported. It invited the commission to present a new report to be issued in the next few days with a view to positively consider the issue next month. Such priority areas are shared by the Dutch government, whose support remains critical for Albania's continuing journey towards the heart of Europe. As it makes strides towards this objective, Albania has benefited from the strong leadership of Prime Minister Rama, whose dynamism has underwritten plaudits from across the continent and beyond. Mr. Rama's own trajectory to the premiership was not a conventional one. Few other heads of government can claim to have been a professor of painting at the Academy of Fine Arts, a player in the national basketball team, and the author of books on politics and painting. Mr. Rama's involvement in politics stems from his role in the democracy movement which toppled Albania's communist regime. He was at that time a key leader of the student movement at the Academy of Fine Arts. He entered politics in 1998 as Minister of Culture, Youth and Sports and two years later was elected Mayor of Tirana in a landslide victory. He held the post for 11 years. His famous initiatives to enliven and modernize the city are known the world over and make Tirana today a sustainable and, it must be said, colorful capital. Since 2005, Mr. Rama has been the chair of the Socialist Party of Albania, which eventually led to victory in last year's elections. He served as Prime Minister, he has served as Prime Minister since September 2013. Mr. Rama, we are delighted to host you as part of our Distinguished Speaker series and look very much forward to your reflections on Albania's European ambitions. My colleague, the Hague Institute's Distinguished Fellow, uh, Nicola Dimitrov, will lead the discussion with Mr. Rama following his lecture. Prime Minister, I now invite you to deliver your remarks. Uh, 
I'm very pleased to be here at Hague, a city symbol of justice beyond borders, and a great seat of collaboration for justice and for developing knowledge on justice and democracy. Peace cannot exist without justice, notes the winner of UNESCO Prize for Peace Education in 1990, pointing out to the essentiality of justice for sustainable societies and a sustainable future. I think that what she says has been ascertained particularly by European history, and it will be ascertained by Balkans history. With historical agreement between Serbia and Kosovo, our region closes for good a chapter of conflicts while it opens for good a new chapter. The Balkan region is finally for the first time in hundreds and hundreds of years since the name Balkans exists, free of conflict and an experience of peace. So now, today, in 2014, rather than 1914, for all the challenges we face, the world is in so many ways better, safer for most, more prosperous, with greater opportunities for all of us. And the Balkans, for the first time in their history, have started a year with everyone home and no one with a gun pointed to the neighbor. And one thing has to be very clear, that this peace, a miracle for many, that only one or two or three years ago would have not imagined to come to this point, is connected with a key word, Europe. None of us in the Balkans has become an angel. We are far from being angels. But everyone has made a clear choice to make peace for the sake of the European perspective. And EU membership has been a crucial incentive toward reconciliation and collaboration within the region, as well as, obviously, a crucial national objective for many of our peoples. As such, various politicians and governments throughout the region, and for certain throughout Albania's history since the early 90s, have used EU membership objective as part of their electoral propaganda, but it has worked as part of the people very deep aspiration. The key argument for this approach to EU membership has been that, that of Albania being in a journey to EU or to, towards EU, European destiny. However, last year we have been elected on quite another way of understanding EU membership and integration to EU. For us, Europe, European Union, is not a destination besides us, beyond us or external to us. It is a destination within us. It is what I would like to call as a daily democracy in our country and the awareness that one day-to-day -day actions as decision makers affect the life and opportunities of people today and generations of tomorrow, the next generations of Europe. Our determination to EU membership and to the integration of Balkans in the EU is about contributing to the success of a brilliant international project, the European Union that would contribute to the prosperity of millions and to a fair world. This project is brilliant due to the values in which it is based. The sociocultural and political sensitivities it endorses and the democratic institutional framework it aims to build. It has been an innovative project 
because it defies age-old nationalisms and generates openness towards a new era of innovation and creativity. This understanding of EU integration requires and brings about a twofold detection. I would call the first one acting and enacting candidacy, and the second one the insistence to ensure the rule of law in each of our countries. Both of these are ways of collaborating and ways of reforming, guided by the awareness that the future of Europe is built in member countries, as much as in candidate countries, as much as in potential candidates, which means in Western Balkans. Thus, the question regarding our countries' membership should not be put as how to make Western Balkans ready for the European Union, but how we all together can build the future and the political European Union. Such understanding of the membership process would provide an enhanced cooperation and increase the responsibilities of all the parts in terms of the effects of the integration and the enlargement process have in citizens' daily life. What the new agenda in EU enlargement puts the South East European region in front of is a larger, denser and threefolded collaboration. Collaboration within the South Eastern European region, collaboration of the region with the EU and collaboration of each of our countries with the EU. The first two are explained through combining objectives, Southeast Europe 2020 strategy with Europe 2020 agenda. Yet there is still important way to go in this combination because I think there is an important way to go in regional cooperation and in transforming the Europe 2020 agenda in concrete steps that affect the quality of life and the quality of daily democracy in each of our countries. We all together, potential candidates, candidate states and member states, face the challenge of addressing sustainable, inclusive, integrated, smart growth and governance for growth, each included in Southeast Europe 2020 vision, coherently with Europe 2020 agenda. Moreover, we all together, are confronted to the challenge of putting daily democracy, citizen quality of life and improved rule of law at the heart of sustainable development and growth-oriented agenda. This de degree of cooperation brings to my mind the approach, histoire, croisé and reflexivity of two French social scientists, Benedict Zimmermann and Michael Werner. Their study reminds us to be mindful of both short-term context of action and the long-term structural conditions that make it possible. So we could be able to manage change and stability at the same time. I think that this deduction is particularly important also in terms of dealing with growing skepticism toward enlargement in many European Union countries. On the other hand, for the Albanians, Montenegrins, Serbians, Macedonians, Bosnians, this must be a start of acting and enacting candidacy. Acting, which means being result-oriented in the process of fulfilling the criteria of membership. Enacting, which means not expecting how Brussels would propose to combine Southeast Europe 2020 strategy with Europe 2020 agenda, or leave this to some inter-ministerial meetings, but include citizens, civil society, universities, in such debate and decision-making process. And also think tanks beyond borders. The criteria for eligibility to join the EU were clearly laid out in June 1993 at the European Council in Copenhagen. However, the most important momentum for the integration of the Balkans has been the Thessaloniki summit of 2003, which adopted an agenda for the integration of the Western Balkans. It, it was henceforth that the EU could project a process of democracy and integration to the Balkans that since the early 90s had been considered in terms of security, peace reconstruction and political stability. Aware that regional cooperation is a key factor in a successful integration, the Albanian government remains actively engaged in regional projects in the fields of infrastructure, energy, tourism, culture and the job market in which we are undertaking, undertaking quick steps for its liberalization. Very promising is also the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, project towards which Netherlands 
has shown interest based on the experience the country has with natural gas. Our government is enthusiastic about these interests and the opportunities this project brings to the country and to the region. It will open many paths to new and innovative collaboration, like for example, the teaming of Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Montenegro and Croatia in a common effort to promote Ionian Adriatic pipeline, which will provide gas to new markets from the Southern Corridor and its reverse flow. Obviously, even without starting its implementation, the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline project has promoted integration in Western Balkans and more largely in Southern Europe by introducing the region as a whole to global networks of development. I think that cooperation among the Benelux countries can be a very good example for the Western Balkans. Various st studies maintain that Benelux countries were not necessarily fit for collaboration, but the success of their initiative derives from their insistence in collaboration. Obviously, European Union, the scientific and historical, though, and the Enlightenment philosophy upon which it is based, refers to building all together each day and through each of our actions, our own destiny. Because I would continue with the words of the activist woman who I mentioned at the beginning. Justice cannot exist without fairness. Fairness cannot exist without development. Development cannot exist without democracy. Democracy cannot exist without respect for the identity and worth of cultures and peoples. The founding fathers of European Union, people like Schumann, Monet, Tindermans, Kreisky, and obviously the, fi the famous Dutch Johann William Bayen had the courage to start for Europe an economic, social, and political project based in justice, fairness, democracy, and respect for people. Nevertheless, we could not blame anyone for being Eurosceptic. However, from our own experience, and also looking at the experience of Benelux countries that gave their cities names to crucial agreements for the EU, like Schengen, Maastricht, Amsterdam, we could say that peace and prosperity are achievements beyond borders. These are the classical nation-state borders, the so-called political borders, but also other borders related to these. The borders that made of biases towards nations, religions, cultures, and ethnic groups. The borders between politics and everyday life. The borders between the reality for politicians and that for the everyday people we try to serve. The borders between the rich and the poor as demonstrated in differences in income and quality of life. The borders of democracy related to representation and participation. So. Uh, I think I'm not stupid. I know that for many countries like this, say Albanian people think Balkans. That means borders, that means war. They also think organized crime, people and drug trafficking, prostitution, illegal gambling. Many other European countries have all that too, but we have the reputation for it. We have to deal with the reality and we are not least by better cooperation with EU states we one day hope to join. Our new government has been working also on the image of the country and we are open to advice. However, this is not only about image, but also and essentially about transformation. And the integration process is a unique tool for transformation. And I think that our countries and also our regions overall brand is essential to its ability to attract tourism and investment, but first and foremost to change the attitude of others towards us. This is not an attempt at addressing a pressing concern of the present, but a major effort to change the future of Albania and of the region. Now, I want to be very frank with you, and I want to say to you that we hope to obtain the candidate status this June, and we hope to shorten the period to our membership. But I strongly believe that Albania need EU as much as EU need Albania. And the Balkans need EU as much as EU need the Balkans. Not seeing it, not getting it, is really a very dangerous way to deal with it. And I strongly believe that it's a time 
for a very important step forward. Yesterday's elections in Europe, for Europe, showed us very clearly that we are in a crossroad between the past and the future. And this crossroad between the past and the future is a crossroad that is also all about the moment we live in the Balkans. Balkans would never be what they are without having Europe in their mind and European Union in their dreams. But Balkans can easily be what they always were if Europe will not have Balkans in the mind and if European Union will not make Balkans part of its own dream. And raising Euroscepticism, or beyond that, raising age-old populism, is showing us that Europe needs to go back to its foundation, to its foundation which was all about strategy and not all about tactics like it is today. We need a common strategy and the only way out of the vicious circle where this old age populism risk to bring all of us in is pass from a tactical Europe connected with the fate of 28 elections per year or every year or every year to come in a Europe that is thinking broadly about a strategic common future. As you know, and I'm sure better than I do, the father of total football theory and practice was a very famous Dutch, Johan Cruyff. However, it seems to me that the philosophy under the total football practice that brought splendid results, making many great teams, is basically about trusting in the capacities of every member of the team, developing all their capacities and using this in continuity. Many countries could have Johan Cruyff play in their own teams, but no one team would be similar to the Dutch team, exactly because total football theory is not about one or a few stars, but is about all the members of the team developing their capacities and using them in continuity. So, I don't know who Albania would be among uh, the players in the bench of uh, the famous Dutch team. But if Netherlands today is Johan Cruyff, the European team need to work as a team of all the members. And the members of this European team are not only them in the pitch, the members of the union, but also them in the bench, seeking for candidate status and seeking to become better and have their chance to enter the pitch. With this remark and just by signaling you that if Netherlands will fail to understand it, we'll lose a big portion of uh, fans in the World Cup because uh, it's the least Albanians can do to take revenge. I stop here and uh, I'm very happy to continue answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, for this uh, powerful remark, powerful speech, and for uh, making a convincing case for the Western Balkans and for Albania. Your um, conclusion reminded me of uh, a remark made by another country, part of the Big Bank enlargement, uh, years ago, when asked why it is a number one priority for the government. The answer was 
Uh, people who are inside often forget how cold, cold it is outside. Mm. And I think it, it still remains today. You can feel it in the Western Balkans, but also you can feel it in the results of the elections yesterday. So many, many of the people inside, in a way, seem, uh, seems have forgotten how cold it is outside. I will start with a uh, few questions before taking the floor to the audience. Uh, I will start with a question that really uh, stayed in my mind, that was rather rhetoric rhetorically put forward by Minister Lajcek last week uh, in this same room, who said, uh, who asked us, can we imagine the Western Balkans today without the uh, European perspective? Where would the region be? And uh, it seems to me that, um, well, the perspective is not explicitly disputed. We all know in the region we don't really have another game in town. In the EU, member countries are aware that it is too dangerous to back and, uh, and, and go back from the promise made in Thessaloniki. The, somehow the process is without energy. The enlargement process, the accession process is without political engagement. Uh, for the region, it seems as the accession is a moving target. And uh, for the EU itself, there are fewer and fewer politicians who are uh, able or, or ready to make a public case in favor of enlargement. Uh, I was wondering if, if you can comment on this, basically the issue of credibility of the European perspective for the Western Balkans. Thank you. Where Balkans uh, could have been without Europe is not difficult to imagine because everybody has uh, in front of uh, the eyes of the memory how much blood and how big conflicts occurred uh, during the last years. And again, I want to repeat uh, the peace that we see today in all the region is the result of the European dream and of the European perspective that people still have in their minds. But where Balkans can go without Europe is very, again, not a very difficult answer. Back to where it was and where it was used to stay in the middle of conflicts. And, but the only thing that may change is the type of conflict. And in that respect, I strongly believe that Ukraine should really learn something fundamental to Europe today about the Balkans. We don't risk uh, an ethnic Crimea. No one is seeking territory by being controversial to Europe. But we risk something that might be not simply a Balkan problem, but then a big European problem, a religious Crimea. Balkans are the heart of Europe geographically and uh, also by history. In the Balkans started the First World War. And Balkans are the only part of uh, the map of the future European Union as we see today where a large part of Muslim community lives. And Balkans are a unique piece of uh, example today of how Christians and Muslims can live in harmony, especially Albania and where Albanians, Muslim Albanians live, are really a striking example of how religious harmony can not only exist, but can uh, be uh, everywhere. And all these people, 
independently from their own uh, religious uh, background, they seek to be part of Europe. But in the same time, Balkans are struggling with a lot of poverty, a lot of unemployment, a lot of social marginalization. And if this European dream will break, and if these tactical refusals will continue to be part of the relation between member states, Europe as such, and the Balkans, a very fertile ground will be there for radical Islam propaganda to start and alienate people vis-a-vis -vis Europe and to create this sense of being rejected by default. This is something we have to avoid if we don't want to face the worst scenario in, the, in, our, in our future. A scenario where in the heart of Europe there is a broken peace and this break is absolutely then impossible to be dealt with for another hundred years. So uh, I very much believe that uh, Balkans need EU, but EU need Balkans. And it's, it's not rhetorical, it's so crystal clear to us that this piece is too large for our shoulders. These countries are too poor. I was telling the Prime Minister today, every time I remember when uh, Albanian Prime Minister had met with the Macedonian Prime Minister, in their press conference they have promised to build together the segment that is missing to connect the railways. And this is a very small segment, but it was never built. And there is a reason, not because they were not sincere in their dream or in their promise, but because when it comes to the end of the year and you prepare the budget of the next year, priorities in poor countries, in developing countries are others. So this segment or many other projects like this are left aside. So we need now a new era of cooperation, which should be economic cooperation, which should be social cooperation. Uh, we need uh, common projects, but we cannot stand this challenge with our own resources. And on the other hand, we are being asked to make painful reforms. So we need somehow to find a way to do it together. We do our homework without pretending that because we are weak, we should be members without doing our homework. But EU does its homework, which is to keep Balkans going in their project, in their new European project of peace and cooperation in the region. Otherwise, this cannot stand. This will break somewhere. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. I would like to kindly invite you to uh, go to Albania for this uh, next question. Uh, I found uh, an interesting quote about actually exactly one year before Albania made its uh, application for uh, EU membership in April 2009, a year ago in Brussels. Then, as a leader of the opposition, you called upon uh, the Albanian government to unite and uh, to join forces encouraged then the government to submit the application. The issue of political polarization is uh, often mentioned with regard to Albania but also with regard to many of the other countries in the Western Balkans as an issue that is an obstacle, a problem on the road to, to Europe. To what extent, what is the situation today? To what extent the European process is a unifier, unifying force in the Albanian politics today? Listen, I, I, I have to tell you very frankly that this polarization thing seems to be a bit uh, of a myth. Because, and it seems to me like uh, many uh, representatives from uh, member states are seeking to find in Albania what they can't find in their own countries. Because I don't think that politics here is not polarized. And 
I don't think that uh, there is no polarization between uh, François Hollande and Marine Le Pen, or between Marine Le Pen, however she's called, or uh, between uh, David Cameron and uh, this uh, other crazy guy. So polarization is everywhere, uh, first. And uh, second, uh, there is something else which is very, very important. Uh, as you said, many people that are in wants to get out, and everyone who is out wants to get in. So uh, them who are in have forgot how cold is out. Them who are out dream that it is warmer than it is in. You know, so uh, it's all matter of uh, dreams and illusions. But uh, as far as we are concerned, I would give you the example of Serbia. When when the radicals won in Serbia, everyone was shaking because. It looked like the European uh, dream of Serbia or this European Serbia dream was fading away. And by the surprise of, for many, the radicals made the peace. Did they become angels? I don't think so. But they, as everyone, got the point. You cannot lead a country in the Balkans if you are not pro-European. So far, thanks God. You cannot be credible if you are not pro-European because your public opinion will not stand you so far. And I think it's in the Europe interest to get it right and to get it now. Because, okay, uh, be, going back to polarization, we all have polarization, but of course in Balkans is much more you know, lovely, it's much more fiery. Uh, the same for old age populism, you know. Uh, I would never wish to see a Balkanic Marine Le Pen. It would, be, uh, it would have been much more, you know, tough. So this is the point. We still believe very much in this project. Maybe we are still naive Maybe you are too cynical about the EU project. But I strongly believe this project, and I strongly believe that if the father, founding fathers would be around, they would have behaved differently in front of this crazy populism, which has told us something very simple. If you play with their cards thinking to beat them, you are finished. There is only one way to beat them, which is to confront them with the values and principles of, that, of the project of the European Union that made so many people dream. So moderates that are avoiding to talk about Europe because they are fearing that they are losing votes are committing a live TV suicide in front of this populists and in front of this uh, Eurosceptics. Uh, Minister Joschka Fischer would have agreed with your last comment. He was here and he gave this advice to exactly that question, how to deal with populism. He said, well, you have to take the, uh, the bull by its horns. Otherwise, it, it won't work. Or as, uh, or, the, or as Churchill said, you know, if you feed the crocodile, you will be the last to be eaten, but uh, to be at, but for sure you'll be at by the crocodiles. So it's, <laughs> there's no chance that you'll make, we've had, you'll make uh, the union with the crocodile. We've had several very encouraging signals coming from many European capitals on the next milestone for Albania, getting the candidate status. You've been visiting various capitals. We had uh, an encouraging message coming from the Greek presidency, from uh, uh, Rome, from Vienna, from... There was cautious optimism after your meeting with Chancellor Merkel in uh, March. Uh, David Lidington recently, I think he summed it up uh, quite nicely, so I will read this uh, line, I will quote him. Our stance in December was that the Rama government had been in power only for a few weeks, and we thought that it was too early to judge their work. 
But when I visited Albania recently, I was impressed by what has been done by this government in very difficult political and economic circumstances. I am encouraged with this progress and we will return to the status issue later in June. Now, I, as someone who served uh, close to 18 years in, in the diplomatic service, I should know better but to ask you what the key messages were at your meeting with Prime, Prime Minister Ruta and earlier with Minister Timmermans and with the leadership of the Dutch Parliament. But I cannot resist the temptation to ask you if after this day in The Hague, you will, have, you will uh, take with you a reason for some optimism when it comes to the Dutch position uh, on the candidate status. This, these meetings are wonderful because you confirm that you love and you are loved, but this is not, this doesn't make the love predictable. So uh, we don't know. I think mm -hmm. that uh, we had very good meetings and uh, uh, I have uh, very high respect, frankly, for what uh, the Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs represent uh, as uh, persons and as uh, politicians. But f from that to the last point, there is, uh, there is this fog of unpredictability of the Europe of today. Because, listen, uh, we are talking about something that I'm sure 90% of parliamentarians in Europe do not know, candidate status. They don't know what it is. And they, they mix it with uh, membership. It has nothing to do with membership. It has nothing to do even with the accession talks. It's, a, it's a, an instrument that was not used nor for Poles, either for Czechs, and even not for Bulgarians and Romanians. It's a very new instrument that was invented by an Italian, as these kind of instruments are usually invented, you know, uh, by people in the Mediterranean. It's not a Northern Europe instrument. Was, was, was invented as such as it is today by Romano Prodi when it was something to be done to avoid the civil war in Macedonia between Albanians and Macedonians. And he had this genius idea to separate accession talks with candidate status. Because before, you had to open accession talks to be considered a candidate. What Romano Prodi did was separating them and bringing this candidate status like an empty shell and telling the Macedonians and Albanians in Macedonia, look, you don't have to kill each other. You have to work together because your place is in, your, in the European Union and now you are candidates. And from that moment, things changed. Just by thinking they had a perspective. So what we are asking, we are asking us we're asking to, 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 to accept for us to give to Albania a push which is very much psychological, first and foremost, and secondly, which will help the country to go forward with reforms. We're not asking money. And becoming candidates, we are not getting more money from your tax, taxpayers, but these people do not know or do not want to know most of the time. And they talk about this like tomorrow Albania will come and will put the hand in the National Bank of Netherlands. It's not true. It's not true. It's totally different. And uh, it will cost nothing to Europe, but it will bring a lot to us. And again, and, and, and we should not let this integration process to become more and more unfair. So, because them who got first in the Union were them who had an easier time to reconnect with their past. Poles, Czechs, for them, communism was very brutal, but it was like a brutal accident that uh, brought the country, uh, countries in agony. And then, after the agony, they had to reconnect with their 
religious institutions, with their academic institutions, with their state institutions. For Bulgarians and Romanians, which were disappointing for many in Europe, these reconnections were was more difficult because the past was more difficult, because communism was more brutal. Imagine now for us and for Serbs and for Macedonians and for Montenegrins and for Bosnians and for Albanians in Kosovo, how much more difficult it is. And the paradoxical part of it is that weaker the country, bigger the pill of homework. Okay, we get it and we are not asking to make less homework, but what we ask is that in parallel with the homework we do individually, as a region, we should be considered as a part of Europe to be built together. We cannot build a European Balkans area just by our own self. And if today we have this uh, moment uh, that, for example, I am supposed to meet with the Serbian Prime Minister and imagine the last meeting between the two Prime Ministers of two uh, neighbor countries was 1946, in the middle of Europe. So all this change that Europe has brought without really doing much concretely, but without being Europe, but through being Europe, through being there, through being attractive, should be accompanied now with a strategy. And, I'm, and you mentioned the meeting with Chancellor Merkel, and this was the outstanding part of the meeting because I, I had a clear sense that the Chancellor has a vision of it. And this is very important because Germany is very important for everyone. You know it better than me. But I think, to close with your with your question, that Joschka Fischer that you mentioned is one of them who gets it fully. And when we met, he was very clear in saying Ukraine is a last very bold, uh, not bold, but a last very, very uh, loud call for the Union to become again strategic and to see the Balkans as a part of itself and not just as another part that is there and that might come when it will come. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. I suggest we take the discussion to uh, the audience. So. Uh, I would kindly ask you to uh, identify yourself and your affiliation, and maybe we will take a sets of three questions and then give the floor back to the Prime Minister. Madam Greek Ambassador, please. Teresa. My name is Teresa Angelato, I'm the Ambassador of Greece. As uh, welcome to The Hague. As Nicola said, the presidency, the Hellenic presidency, has attached uh, huge importance to the Balkans. And as you know, we are one of the countries that we want enlargement. For me, it was uh, quite a surprise when I was writing my invitations that I could not invite Albania as a candidate country. For, for us, is obvious. Uh, but it's not Greece that uh, will decide, of course. You mentioned uh, the Eurosceptics, you mentioned the European Parliament, and you mentioned this crazy guy. How is his name? My question is, how we are you going to deal? How do you think that you are going to deal when you will receive the uh, positive reply in June from the European Council? You will become a candidate country, but you will have to deal with the Parliament that it seems that will be a bit different from what it is now. How will you convince them? Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Maybe we, we take three okay, and okay. then 
Uh, uh, Willem van Ekelen, I have a question a bit in the same line, but first I want to congratulate you, because I think 20 years ago, a little more, Albania was the most isolated country in Europe, and perhaps in the world. And I think since then you have made enormous progress, you have had democratic elections, you had changes in the composition of your government, so you are more or less like us. So I'm in favor of candidate status, that, that's clear, because I cannot imagine that in the long run the Balkan countries uh, stay out. Uh, that would be bad for them, but it would also be bad for us. Now my question is, um, first I was tempted to, to make a comparison with Putin and uh, what he was saying about uh, protecting Russian speakers uh, wherever they are, but I'm not. Uh, I, I will ask you now a more a, a, a perspective question. Do you think it is possible for the countries in the Western Balkan, which are now candidates or about candidates, to come in separately? Or is it more or less inevitable that they will have to join together. And I ask that particularly because of the fact that Albanians are also important elements of other countries. So how do you deal, how do you deal with your neighbors uh, in that context? Thank you. We'll go in the second row, uh, the ambassador of Denmark. Thank you very much. I'm the, I hate to admit it, but I'm the ambassador of Denmark and uh, I know we have very special relations with Albania because you were actually referring to football and I think one of the last losses we have in that was against Albania, but I'll come back to that. But talking about football, I also think that my Minister of Foreign Affairs was famous in 1992 when he actually, when we got the uh, EU Championship of Football because he was referring to the fact that if you can't beat them, then you have to join them. And that is basically also how I hear you saying it today, if I don't understand it correctly. But I wanted to ask you, actually, um, uh, the criteria which you were referring to, the Copenhagen criteria from 1992, is that still, uh, as you see, the most valid uh, one, or do they need to have been changed? And how will you actually uh, give us very good arguments to some of those skeptics, which I think we have in many of the European countries, uh, in order to make sure that we maintain these criteria. And my second question is, once you move from being uh, an applicant to be a, a candidate, uh, how long time do you actually perceive that you will stay on as a candidate country? Will it be five years or 10 years or 15 years? Will it be like Turkey or will it be like someone else? Good questions, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry you remember this defeat uh, in football, but somehow you have to be thankful to us because uh, it was one of very ra rare cases you have to, to taste defeat. We taste defeat every day, everywhere, in everything, so uh, I would be very happy to change place, and uh, uh, I'm, and I would be very happy to welcome defeats in football. You know, being uh, Dan, um, but anyway, there are also good things about being Albanian for sure. Uh, I would say you, you you make me a question if we'll be in Europe in five, ten, fifteen years. Assuming that Europe will be what it is today, because it may be also the other way uh, around to see it, where you will be in 15 years as Denmark, if things go like this. The people that won yesterday in your country are not very nice, frankly. Uh, so uh, I to, very nice towards Europe, not as persons. I don't know them, and I don't want to know them. Uh, uh, so uh, it will all depend from the interaction, not just from one side. And the question that the minister made is, is the big question 
to be made not to us, but to, to the member states. How they want to deal with the Balkans, one by one or all together. I don't say that the best is to, to deal all together because this will alienate them even more than they are alienated. So uh, I think we have to obey to the rules, so we have to do our homework. But for sure, strategically, uh, it's time to, to change attitude. And uh, it's time to see it as a piece of a problem which is not just our problem in the Balkans, but, but which is a European problem. And you bait me, you asked me how, what, with what arguments, uh, what arguments one would use to convince the Eurosceptics. The Eurosceptics cannot be beaten by arguments. If you argue with them, you lose the argument. They can be beaten only by dreams and hopes, and only by a common project that is, for people, credible and appealing, much more than their arguments. Their arguments work because the project is not appealing anymore. Their arguments work because the dreams and the hopes have uh, left the place to cynicism and pragmatism and tacticism. This is why their arguments work. I'm not sure that their arguments, I'm not sure that this guy in, in, in London would have been so gloriously victorious if Churchill was alive, for example. Just to say that, you know, it's, it's not from, from the arguments that you can get, you can survive. And I remember the best moment of uh, the Greek Prime Minister vis-a-vis -vis these idiots of Golden Dawn, because, we, you know, for them I don't have another word, sorry. Uh, the best moment was when he, when he went after them publicly, straightforward, when this uh, rapper was killed. His speech in television, in front of the Greek people, was the fantastic moment that should be the daily moment of everyone that believe in Europe and European values with these people. He went after them, straightforward, and then they, they punished them as accordingly to the crime they did, and so their numbers went down. Because people, the, it, in that moment, their numbers went down, Ambassador. I know that you represent also them, and I'm sorry for you, but uh, the, their numbers <laughs> went down at that time. But it, it, didn't go, it didn't go along like this all the time, and this is the problem. You know, to see, uh, to, to, to see and to what, to listen to French socialists being, uh, you know, being uh, in difficulty to talk about Europe, is the end of the world. You know, the party, the, the party of Francois Mitterrand being, you know, in trouble to, to, to and trying to, like, like, justifying themselves that they believe in Europe, you know. This is opening space for this kind of other things that have nothing to do with Europe. So, uh, on one hand, you know, cynically, for us, it's a consolation because we are not the only part of Europe in trouble. But, at the same time, I think that to get out of this trouble, Europe needs a strategy, needs to be strategic again, you know. So, because winning these elections, when, you know, winning these elections with smaller and smaller margin, it's showing something, you know. So to change this trend, we need something bigger. And uh, so I think we are all in it now. And it's not rhetorical to say that we need Europe as much as Europe needs us. And it's not anymore about candidates, members, but it's about where this continent will go in the next 10 or 20 years. And there's also something else which is very important to be underlined. The, because we are, we are facing, in the Balkans, uh, this challenge on organized crime, organized crime, organized crime, which is fine. But 
in the meantime that there is a, a political European Union which is weaker and weaker, there is a European Union of crim criminals which is very efficient and very interconnected. So you don't have any more organized crime which is local, an Albanian organized crime or a Greek organized crime or an Italian organized crime. It's all it's multinational. So if you, if you go after every group, you have it multinational. So strengthening the ranks, enlarging, and strengthening the ranks will mean much more safety and security for everyone. It's not that you keep uh, the Balkans out and you are safer. It's the other way around. You get the Balkans in and you are safer. Because interconnection of crime today is much, much stronger in some aspects and much more efficient and for sure far less bureaucratic, I would say, than uh, you know, in these political levels. Let's invite another round of questions. We are a bit running out of time. Uh, Mr. Chadri there, back the fourth row. Mr. Prime Minister, my name is Khaled Ahmed Chaudhary and I'm from International Human Rights Commission. Sir, last Saturday, in a city of Netherlands, Middelburg, I was sitting few seats behind the king, the queen, and the prime minister of Netherlands, while there was a ceremony of four freedom awards by President Roosevelt's uh, foundation, which says Netherlands, the country where we are sitting right now, cares for the human rights, care for, for the human values. And in that context, I have a question for you. The track record of Albania in regard to human rights, rule of law, and justice isn't that good. There have been many concerns. According to the UN Committee Against Torture, there have been extrajudicial killings by the law enfor enfor enforcement uh, agencies. There have been issues of orphans, homeless orphans. There have been issues of Romas. There have been, there have been issues, the protesters against the government, thrown into the prison, tortured, humiliated. So would you please help us that Albania right now qualified in regard to human rights and uh, the rule of law? I, I am a well-wisher and I fully agree with you that certainly Albania should at some end point should be allowed to become member. Thank you, sir. Uh, Albania deserves your respect because have has outvoted the government that killed the protesters, I think. So, uh, yes, it was a time and not a long time. It's, uh, 2011, when protesters were killed in the street. And uh, two years later, the government that killed the protesters was outvoted by a very large majority. When it comes to torture, I think uh, no country is perfect on that. Even the big democratic countries are perfect on that and know it. But, and I don't think that uh, Albania makes any exception. And I don't think that Albania has anything in that regard that uh, is more than the normal, or let's say, more than the piece of it that is in relation with the population and with the country and everywhere, everywhere. And uh, again, uh, you, I understand, uh, but again, you mix. We are not asking to become members. It's a totally different thing, you know, because you again said, uh, do, you, do you deserve to be? If it was, if you would ask me today, do we agree, do we deserve to be members of this union, full members, based on what does it mean in terms of all these uh, benchmarks? I would say no, simply no. We are not ready to become members. But candidates, what does it mean? 
candidates, we should have been three years ago. It's, it's the only country that has been refused three times in a row. I understand that uh, the, the political situation and what you mentioned, the killing of protesters, elections that were really not uh, very democratic, have had the power on decision. But how one can explain me that after having been told, literally, make free and fair elections that are recognized by all sides and guarantee peaceful rotation of power, and then make, approve consensually this law, this law, and this law, and you have it. And the Commission in September proposed to give to Albanian candidate status. So, it's the Commission that makes the evaluation. If this process is objective and is predictable, if this process is subjective and not predictable, then everyone in every parliament can stand up and, and can say, no, 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 because, you know, there is a lot of uh, prostitution, which is not true. We, we, ha we have a problem with uh, trafficking of women, but we don't have prostitution. Prostitution is in EU. We, ha we have the prostitutes. So, uh, you know, uh, just to give you an example, it, 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 that's why I said, you know, with organized crime. Organized crime, what does it mean? Organized with whom? Between ourselves? Between ourselves, there is no efficiency. Because our GDP, it's enough to see our GDP and to compare with this report of corruption in European Union to understand what, what are we talking about, you know? Uh, making Albania the symbol of corruption. And are you telling me that Serbs that got the negotiation are less corrupt or Serbia has less problem with corruption it goes it goes with uh, some parameters and it's clear no and are you telling me enlargement fatigue you are fat you have fatigue for Albania and you don't have fatigue for Serbia how it comes if you have fatigue you have fatigue for everybody if you if you have fatigue for somebody and not for somebody there's something wrong so it's at the end, you know, I can stand this discussion seriously for one hour, and then after one hour, I start to have problems with it, you know, because it's ridiculous, simply ridiculous. You know, Maybe Albania this. is in Europe, has always been in Europe, and deserves to be candidate for the European Union. And the European Union has to grant us the candidate status in June by no other way. If it is for us, for what we have done, if it is then for, how is called this blonde guy you have in Netherlands, then things may be different, you know, but... Maybe this is a signal for me. Sorry for my frankness, but I, I was invited here to be frank, no? So... Uh, Maybe it is a signal for me to try global to... Global justice. I'm trying to do global justice. <laughs> Get things towards uh, close uh, and... The remarks reminded me of uh, an anecdote that is quite famous in NATO context. At the Madrid summit in 97, when the alliance invited the Czech Republic, Hungary and Poland, the then Czech uh, Deputy Foreign Minister, Sasha Vondra, asked a group of American senators, why us? Why did you choose us? And the senators said, well, um, we like you. We think you like us, and you talked it into our heads for so long that we couldn't say no anymore. <laughs> so maybe I will uh, end on that note. Uh, liking and perceptions obviously matter, and uh, in, in our region, we need some work to do in that regard as well. So I, will, uh, I would like to thank you very much for uh, your generous time, the frankness, I think you made a compelling case uh, in asking Europe to uh, think strategically in terms of our region. I would like to uh, thank our guests that are here for many of them uh, 
two times in a matter of days. So I promise we won't invite you for a while, at least for a few days. And I would like to invite uh, uh, everyone to the reception in your honor, Mr. Prime Thank Minister. You.